I think I should rename this to It Takes a Village 2.0 because I've been giving this talk successively over two years now and it keeps expanding. So I may go a little bit fast in the beginning and then slow down a little bit more at the end in regards to you know, what's the newer pieces that have come into play. Um, so first of all, who am I? I'm Salona Bonvald. Um, I'm the executive director of IEEE SA Open and here's all the different ways that you can contact me. Um, what I wanted to first talk about was the benefits of diversity. And we, I might be preaching a little bit to the crowd here um, in regards to that. Oops. But, <laughs> but um, there's uh, several different studies that the Harvard Business Review did showing all of the different things that happen when you have diversity in your company, in your crew, in your executive boards, and things of that nature. You get better quality products, you get more innovation, you get increased productivity, you have less biases, um, clearer communication, less tribal knowledge because you can't be as, as assumptive, um, which means you also get better long-term documentation and larger communities. All of these things are things I can believe that open source can greatly benefit from. So, and I also want to ask, you know, this question for a lot of times, if you're not diverse, are you really open? So, um, so why role diversity? Why did I focus on that one particular flavor of diversity? Well, one, because going after that actually counters a lot of common problems that happen in diversity. And what I mean in regards to that is a lot of times diversity does not equal inclusion. And so by going through and doing something like role diversity, you're actually um, going through what's called a functional diversity, which means you automatically give roles and things of that nature, which I know sometimes it's antithetical to the open source way of meritocracy and things of that nature. It actually helps other people that are coming in that are new to the community, where you can do things in regards to manager expectations. If I come in and I'm new to open source and I'm like, hey, I do marketing, or you know, I'm a director of marketing, or I do these kind of things, you automatically set expectations tell people who you're there and what you're there for, and it actually lends to a easier going community in many different ways for that. Um, also, it's more about the expertise aspects so that people can bring in their expertise, and you can go through and focus on those things that we talked about earlier in regards to things like production quality, and um, it makes it easier for, to recruit volunteers. One hard thing that comes in when you're recruiting is they're always like, what am I going to do? I don't know what I would be able to give you. You know, why would it be useful at all for me to come in here? If you have those roles, it makes it easy. They're like, oh yeah, no, I know this. I can come in, I can help you with this. And in a weird way, it makes it less political in regards to the normal other types of diversity identity politics. Instead, it's your job, it's what you got a degree in, it's what you got a certification in, it's things of that nature. So basic rules go where they are. You're not going to get anything different if you're fishing in a goldfish, goldfish bowl. You're only going to get goldfish. So you're going to have to get out there and see all the different ones in there. Um, also remember in regards to that, you need to, get, you need to respect their differences as well. It's really hard to make a bunch of marketing people work in GitLab. They're not used to pull requests. Guess what? The tools in GitLab for them suck. <laughs> <laughs> right? They can't do any of their imaging stuff. They can't do a lot of different things like that. Same thing for bringing in nonprofits and governmental entities. Once again, our tools are not made for them. We're going to have to evolve and go to them. Um, <clears throat> the other thing to remember is the value of newbies. I think most of y'all are already familiar with this since working in open source. But the big thing on there is the same things that you're already used to. Most of these people aren't actually newbies. They're experts in their own field. They've been doing these different things. They're just new to open source. They're new to how we do things. Um, and so for that, we have to sit there and work with them on that. And so we can get rid of a lot of the tribal knowledge that's happened, because we got a lot of tribal knowledge. We can affix assumptions. And um, we can make it easier to um, be able to ask questions without fear, because sometimes those questions may blow your mind because you hadn't even considered that perspective, especially with designers and special interest groups and things of that nature. And so that way you can go through and have better quality and usability. So what are we doing at IEEE SA Open? Well, we're evolving the open source platform. 
Um, we needed our tools to be 100% open source, so we're only using open source tools. Um, we're focusing a lot in regards to metrics because one of the things that I view is that I think one reason we became so developer-centric is because the successful open source projects were developer to developer. You know, that was Apache, that was Linux, that was Kubernetes, all these different things were good because it was one to the other. And we got lazy. We use convenient data for how we measure things off of GitHub. We talk about commits and pull requests and things of that nature. None of that is friendly to any of these other people that are in your community that are already probably actually doing things like throwing events like these for you or um, doing the marketing for events like these or things of that nature. There's this disastrous convenient data out there where those volunteers never get really rewarded within that community. So um, we wanted it to be transparent, findable, granular, traceable, all these things that you're probably already used to. And of course the big one, respectful of rights because we are IEEE and we're global. So one of the things that we've been working on for the platform is this community process which kind of first starts off with documentation. So we have the different groups that create documents, and then they'll try to templatize it. And then we'll automate, measure it, make sure it's working, and then go through the standardization process. The standardization process at IEEE is not fast. Okay, maybe I should rephrase that. IEEE thinks that two years is fast, <laughs> which isn't normally the way that open source views it, correct? So we have to work with that. We also have to work on creating rewards. We're doing, we have a badging subgroup that's you know, specifically focused on that for looking for those types of things in regards to healthy, accurate, and kind. We are a little bit Daniel Pink biased in regards to that. Um, and then of course, giving credit. And so we're looking at that in regards to the platform too as to how do we give credit to these diverse roles that are coming in because we can't do the pull requests, we can't do any of those different models. And they're all queuing in and saying the different ways that they do want to be measured. I gave a presentation on behalf of your project. I should get some kind of thing for that. Or I went and I tweeted a whole bunch of stuff about social media and got this many retweets. Or I went in and I did an evaluation with all of my students of your platform and came back with this feedback on your user interface. All of those things we can go in and start to give recognition for. <clears throat> There's a whole bunch of other initiatives right now that are working on role diversity as well. Um, we work a lot with chaos. Um, at the Linux Foundation. Um, uh, Amanda Kasari is doing a lot in regards to Ocean. Um, there's also an academic one, which is Kasari, but Kasari and Credit, I think, just split a few months ago. And then, of course, earlier we heard from Heath in regards to um, digital principles and digital impact, which are the digital public goods, so, and their work, too. So one of the things we're doing is we're eating our own cooking. So we're very meta right now, and we have been pretty meta for a while, which makes it a little bit hard to recruit. So um, what we're doing on that, I'll talk about what the meta levels are, and so we're doing a lot of different collaborations. As you noticed, we're, you know, we're participating with a lot of other groups like Chaos, like the Open Source Way 2.0, like all of these other different projects that are out there. <clears throat> and so we've been basically trying to gather together a bunch of social media experts. We're also working on a standard, too, in regards to open source governance. Um, but that isn't the platform. That's something that's actually completely separate. But I'll talk about that in a little bit. We're community driven. IEEE is a 501c3, which in America means something very significant. I, um, 501c3s are actually tax deductions, which means the IRS cares a lot about what you do and how you do it and the forms you have to file. It's different than a lot of the other organizations that are C6s, which are business consortia. So we have a lot of extra rules, which means sometimes things take longer, but it also means that volunteers decide my budget. Volunteers decide where the different things go. It's not a corporate entity. In fact, they do a lot of stuff to prevent corporate dominance for exactly that reason. Um, right now in our community architecture, we have OSCOM, which is the open source committee that reports directly to the Board of Governors, which again are volunteers. And then we, underneath them we have the, our different advisory groups. We have a community one, and a marketing one, and a technical one. And then they all have subgroups. So the community one, this is kind of a little bit older because there's more subgroups underneath each of them. But we have things like badging, DEI, education, and then for the marketing AGs we've got the um, events, social media toolkits, metrics, 
and, and a lot going on with OSINT, as you can probably imagine, that we were already doing it and then it exploded with the whole situation in Ukraine. And then we have the technical AGs, which are doing, um, where we're drinking our own wine in regards to the platform. And then with OSCOM, we're doing a lot of the uh, governance of the platform too, with like the operations manual, the governance, the naming, all of those different rules. And you can sit there and see all these different ones. We are in GitLab. Everything goes into the GitLab, which can sometimes be, like I said, a little bit difficult. But, <clears throat> you know, the community is helping evolve that. So the community advisory group is, I think of as the heart of what we're trying to do. It's all of the users and the special interest groups and the nonprofits. You know, IEEE has a very big nonprofit academia leaning. And so this is where that all really comes into play. And so they do a lot of the leadership in regards to that. N not all of these people are technical people, okay? But they're leaders and they know what needs to be done and how it needs to be done and they're very strategic thinkers. The next one we have is the marketing advisory group, um, who I feel is so often the unsung heroes of open source, um, which is basically not just marketing, but evangelism, social media, events, designers, artists, that whole group. Um, and so they've been working on a bunch of different things, including like marketing toolkits. So any new project that comes in, it's like, oh, here's a little toolkit. Here's how you can go and do your stuff. <clears throat> and then lastly, the technical advisory group, which you probably think you know what it is, but it isn't. Um, it's more meta in regards to it. It's not the technical steering committee that you're probably used to in open source. Instead, it's a group that helps create all the different things to help on the technical processes. Um, they also drink their own wine too in regards to the evolution of those processes. So for example, they've been doing things like creating what is the checklist and the process for new tool and feature creation on this platform. So they're opening that and then also sending, giving that to the other projects saying, this is how we're doing it. We would love it if you would come and do that too. Um, they're also, they also talk a lot about the prioritization and logistics and then they're doing things like they have the security stuff and things of that nature, and they have like the production readiness checklist, and they're bringing in more of the product and project management and the architectural aspects that often is kind of missing in open source projects. You know, they don't typically always have a role for that, and, we're, and they're bringing that in. So for example, this is one of the things that the tag created, and so it's like community suggests a tool. They have a community checklist where they go through and go, what does this open source project actually look like if we're gonna adopt it? Is it viable? Is it actually open source? Um, you know, how is their community doing? Are they bug fixing? Are they, you know, where's all of that at? Um, does, how does it look in regards to other open source tools that have similar functionality? Things of that nature. Then they have a community notification and then we do a proof of concept install. Because as we know, all open source projects are completely accurate about the features that they have and how well they're working. Um, and so the community then goes and like throws stones at it and hits it with sticks and then comes back and says whether or not they approval, approve it. And then we go through an open approval process and we um, do an architectural review and pricing and then we submit it to IEEE where it then goes through a bunch of IEEE processes as well involving the board of governors too. Um, and as well legal and things of that nature. So we go through and like make sure everything's copacetic. Um, and so that's the area where you go in and do that. Um, and then we do a lot of integrations back and forth. And so, for example, the education group got together, did an evaluation of the platform, and then went to the tag and said, hey, we did an evaluation. This was good. This wasn't. This is what we would like to have, da-da-da-da-da. And then also gave feedback on their evaluation process, too. So one of the things that we talk about is going 100% open source. Um, and what that means is, you know, um, three different directions. So not only are we using open source tools like GitLab, CE, and Mattermost, and Big Blue Button, and things of that nature, um, but we're also open sourcing our, um, the platform itself for the containerization and all, on all of those other different integrations together. Um, and then we're also um, allowing other entities to use our platform as well. We've actually already done one version of that now, where we've set that up for another nonprofit, uh, uh, sorry, another coalition. And then across streams, so if they want new features, we can go back and forth across the different platforms so that the, the platforms can stay integrated as well. 
So right now, we're just doing uh, Mattermost, uh, GitLab, and Big Blue Button. Um, some of the tools that we're evaluating, we actually have already done um, Plant UML. Um, and uh, so we're looking at the other different ones, and that's what the community's looking at. Um, and, and it's really important because we have to support that community. And as I was saying earlier with role diversity, the whole reason we're 100% open source is so that we can do role diversity. We can change those tools. We can make them better. We can integrate in the ones that they want. We can go through and do all of that. And that way the community can also change them themselves. So we want it to be, you know, this is the dream. IEEE is known for doing this certain level of um, quality. And it might take us a while, but this is where we're going. So what are we doing right now? Well, one, we've got the um, standard that I was talking about, which where they're talking about best practices on open source governance. And so they're going through each of those different pieces. Um, some of y'all have actually been on that call <laughs> that are in the room. Um, we're also working this year on a codathon in a box. We already have workshop in a box, but we're taking that out to student services at IEEE so that any university group who wants to come in and start doing codathons on our platform can do so and be supported. Um, we're evolving the platform for and by the volunteers, so that just keeps progressing. As you saw, we have the different tools coming through. And then also doing technical support for some of those different diverse roles. So best practices, this is where you'll want to go in regards to the standard that's happening. It's first right now where it's, there's a whole process for doing standards, okay? First you have a study group and, then you, and you create a PAR and then you submit the PAR and then you go through the entire PAR um, approval process and, um, and that's how you actually get to a standard. Um, one of the things that's interesting about IEEE is we are doing what's called an individual-based standard, not an entity, which means uh, you bring yourself, not a corporate um, perspective in regards to it so that we don't have corporate dominance. And one of the things that we look for on a lot of this is making sure that it's not just one company coming in and dominating it, saying this is what it's going to be. Instead, if you look at who all has been attending these, it's all over the place. It's a lot of foundations, it's a lot of nonprofits, it's a lot of academics and academic institutions. Um, and then we've got a bunch of public sector that's also been showing up too. So. Um, and then we're, you know, open sourcing it. And so the two new tools that we do, we have a thing called Open Up, which is where we're slowly putting all the open source code to open up the platform itself. It's been a little bit slow going on the infrastructure's code um, because that's not always easy to make clean. Um, but that's one of the things that we're working on. And then also um, we've done a scalable um, containerized big blue button so that you can do a lot of different pieces. We have a lot of stuff that's happening in regards to the roles. Um, where we're implementing a lot of processes to integrate better in regards to the IEEE's um, governance structures um, for each of our um, advisory boards where they report into the Strategic Management and Delivery Committee as well as the Board of Governors. And we've also got the IEEE Foundation Fund um, that's called SA Open. And that is where we're looking at for um, platform development and ex expansion. I said, that, I said that we had one entity that already did an implementation of our open source platform that was funded through the fund. Um, we had a foundation donate into the fund, and then we took out of it and created that for them. Um, and so the cool thing about that is it was painful, but all the paperwork is ready now. <laughs> so now we actually have a better process for how we're going to be bringing in the money for doing those kind of things and, and sending it back out again. Um, we're also looking at doing that for additional resources too. So say you have a group that comes forward and they need a security audit, or they need help with marketing, or they need help with things of that nature. We're figuring out what the governance process for that is going to be for giving them money out of the foundation. Um, so where do we go next? Well, more platform expansion. We're just barely scraping the top right there. Um, of course, there's a big thing at IEEE in regards to open hardware, because that's what we're more, more known for than open source software, obviously. Um, so doing some different um, adaptions for that, because uh, I think we already know that GitHub's not going to do that for us. So we need to get in there and do that. Um, same for open data, and then also doing some best practices in open data metrics, um, so that we can get to those numbers that we were talking about. And so if you want to join us, Here's all the links. I'll be sharing the slides on Twitter. And thank you. Questions? <laughs> so
So are there any questions from the audience? Critiques? Neither. Things you see missing? Things you think are impossible and want to know if it's really going to happen? It doesn't seem to be the case. In, <laughs> in that I was trying to let them be controversial. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. So you spoke about like how, how creating pull requests is not easy for a few folks who are contributing in some different way. Mm -hmm. And I had that with, in my previous work where I was struggling to like, you know, I did like a workshop with them to explain, hey, this is how you do a request and they're contributing to documentation. Are you, uh, like in any of your projects, are you act or, I think this is something people are working on. Maybe I just don't know about it, but like are people working on like easier ways uh, people could submit these pull requests without doing the whole procedure, you know? Like, are there ways to help non-technical folks, if I may put it that way, uh, to help contribute to this? So one of the things that we're looking at is a bunch of different tools. And so that's what the education group went in and did, that, that subgroup. They went in and they sat there, and they're the reason we're evaluating Nextcloud and Calabra, is because they're like, we can't stand doing our documentation in GitLab. And I don't blame them one bit, because I can't stand it either. And of course, we don't want to be using Google Docs for obvious reasons. So um, they're one of the groups that submitted that and asked for that. We're having some problems with the licensing issues because if it's open core, it's much easier for us, but they are not open core. So we have to figure out what that arrangement is going to be because um, IEEE has 420,000 members worldwide. Um, <laughs> you know, so we have to figure out what that is. Um, but there is some things going on like that. Also, the marketing group has have us looking at, um, is it Pinpot? Because they wanted some additional tools to help with the um, collaboration of graphics. And so there's, there's a bunch of different open source tools that are out there, and so people are kind of asking for those right now. Um, we did kind of spoil them a little bit with Big Blue Button, because Big Blue Button has that shared notes that's so awesome, and so they got really used to collaborating in that, and they're just like, we want this, but for bigger and longer and not just at the meeting. And so that's why we're looking at some of those other different ones. But no, I haven't found anything great for that in regards to GitLab and making it easier for them. Um, you know, we had that same problem working with um, Karsten Wade on the uh, um, Open Source Way 2.0 because that was all being done within um, GitHub though, right? And it was just, it was very painful. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very painful for our writers because they were like, I can do documentation, but this is just, ah. And so, um, and I think that we need to have something more along those lines for things like open standards in the future because um, you often have these arguments that occur over and over again about some particular topic. And if you don't have a good way of saving that discussion in a versioning system, you're gonna have those same arguments every year, and we would like to circumvent a little bit of that, and it's not always apparent um, in GitLab when you have those. Plus, balloting measures would be nice, too. <laughs>